Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Rosen Apostolov and I will be the host of today's event. Before we start, I have a few announcements to make. First, this uh, webinar is being recorded and uh, you will find a recording available on our website bioexcel.eu slash webinars that you can listen to the webinar later or share with your colleagues. At the end of the webinar, we will have a Q&A session during which you will be able to ask questions directly to Alexander. Uh, during the webinar, you can uh, uh, ask your questions in the chat or the questions interface in the application. And at the end, I will give you the microphone to us directly. If we have problems with the connection, I will ask the question on your behalf. Today's presentation is uh, the first presentation of the BioExcel Educational Webinar Series and I would like to give you a short overview of uh, BioExcel. BioExcel uh, is a Center of Excellence for Computational Biomolecular Research and it was established in November last year. The, the center uh, works in three main directions. The first one is uh, towards providing excellence in biomolecular science and we work with three uh, important and widely used software packages uh, which are Haddock, about which we have today's webinar and you know very well. Uh, we have in the center uh, Gromax for molecular dynamic simulations and also CPMD uh, which is a code that can be used for hybrid QMMM simulations for example of enzymatic reactions. Another objective of uh, the center and area in which we provide uh, expertise and services is in usability and we work towards making uh, various applications and tools to be uh, more uh, usable. We develop and integrate workflows uh, along with data integration services uh, with the final goal of devising more efficient uh, workflows for all the users. We work with uh, several of the quite popular platforms uh, and workflows such as Galaxy, OpenFacts, CNIME, CompSSS and Apache's Taverna. In addition to working with the codes and uh, providing workflow environments, uh, BioExcel is uh, working heavily on providing training uh, and expertise to both academia and industry. So this includes not only university uh, researchers but also industrial users from pharma, chemical and food industries. Uh, we work also together with uh, uh, commercial software vendors and resource providers such as HPC centers. What may be interesting for you is to know that uh, as part of the center we are starting uh, the establishment of uh, several interest groups in different areas and uh, uh, domains of computational biomolecular research. Uh, we are starting with six interest groups. The first one is on integrative modeling and we hope that uh, you might be interested to join this interest group. Uh, we will send you information about it uh, later. Uh, we have also interest groups on free energy calculations where uh, which you know are uh, very important for areas such as computational drug design and uh, other areas. We have interest group on best practices for performance tuning since some of our codes such as Gromax are very highly tuned. They run on different architectures and it's sometimes challenging to uh, take make the best of their power. Uh, Similarly, we have one on, uh, interest group on hybrid methods. Uh, this is mainly for CPMD users where you could uh, tackle problems on also electronic structure level. We have also interest group for entry level users where uh, we offer very easy uh, portals for uh, 
uh, running applications. And we have another interest group on practical applications for industry, which targets specifically users from companies. And uh, we're looking into how best we could support their work. You could find more about how to get in touch with BioXL and more about us on our website. Uh, we provide support forums. Uh, there's code repositories where we will keep uh, the code that we develop. We have an open chat channel, video channel where we have the webinars. So that's all for BioXL. And uh, without any other introductions, I would like to present you today's speaker. Uh, Professor Alexander Bonvin, which uh, some of you maybe know, he is the main developer of the Haddock software, and uh, he uh, his uh, his work on different computational uh, approaches for biomolecular interactions uh, are very popular, and uh, I hope uh, you will find today's presentation very um, useful. So, I would like to ask now Alexander to start. Okay. So, if all goes well, you should be seeing my screen now. Rosen, can you confirm before I move on? Yes, it. Uh, yes, we can see it. Thank you. Good. So, well, welcome everyone uh, who is online. I'm going to tell you a bit about uh, integrative modeling of complexes uh, using Haddock and Haddock 2.2, as you see on the title slides. So I want to give you a short introduction and then give you more specific of what the web server can do for you and what a local version will do for you to, to explain the differences. So as probably all of you are well aware, we are living in times where we have a huge amount of um, genomic, proteomic and interactomic data that are coming out and uh, we have to try to make uh, sense of this puzzle and when it comes to interactions it means uh, this large number of, of, of dots connected by lines that you see now so-called interactomes where proteins are, are the, the points and the connections indicate complexes that they can form and there is a huge number of connections there are many more connections and there are players in this uh, so the, the, the structural landscape that you would like to cover is much larger than the, the, the proteome landscape that we are dealing with and try to understand what goes wrong in those connections often requires taking the step to modeling the structure or solving the structure of those 3D complexes. Uh, but solving those structure is not always easy. Uh, Cryo-EM these days sees a, a huge boom, uh, so there's a lot of exciting work being done. So we'll see, I guess, a lot of new large complex molecular machine being sold by CryoEM. X-ray is of course still a major player but is also encountering difficulties with the more maybe flexible complexes and membrane associated complexes and next to that you have NMR of course which is also contributing to populating this 3D landscape of complexes but given the, the, the complexity of this landscape and the huge number of interactions uh, we also need complementary computational techniques and this is where uh, our approach and our software is coming. So if we look at uh, somewhat maybe all the data, this is taken from a review by uh, Patrick Alois group from a 3D Interactome, where they have been looking at the coverage, the structural coverage of Interactomes in a PDB. And uh, you see here uh, <clears throat> E. coli and you see human. And the number of interactions that are listed here uh, are only interactions that at the time have been experimentally documented and validated. So we expect orders of magnitude more interactions uh, for sure in human compared to the say 45,000 that are listed here. Now if for those documented interactions you go look into the protein database 
what is the information in terms of 3D structure which is available, and let's just look at, at human. You see that for human, for only about 5% of the complexes, uh, we have a full structure of the complex. Uh, you might have uh, five more percent, even less than that, for which you might have only uh, domain domain interactions that have been solved, so not the full complex, or you might be able to build model of the complex, for example, by homology modeling. And then you have this large blue fraction, which represent about 50 percent of the of those interactions for which we do know the structure of the interactors, so the, the individual component of the complex, but not the complex. And this large blue fraction, which is even larger in E. coli, is the, basically the, the, the regions where modeling, uh, using methods like docking, can play a significant role. Because we have the starting point of the complex, so then what we have to solve is basically a 3D puzzle. So molecular docking, in, in a nutshell, you're trying to predict the structure of, uh, in this case, in this example, two proteins using a number of descriptors to measure how good those uh, the models are that you generate. So shape will play a role here, and there are algorithms that are using mainly shape to model those complexes. Uh, electrostatics, of course, is also an important component when it comes to molecular recognition. Uh, Van der Waals interactions, you see here Lena Jones potential. So these are all say physical chemical energy terms that might be incorporated into this, uh, uh, this docking software and what you see here in the middle, I will come a little bit later to that, is the kind of function that we are using to represent the experimental information. Now my title says integrative modeling, so we don't want to do modeling ab initio uh, uh, just for the sake of it, we want to integrate as much information as possible in the modeling process. And these days, uh, there is a lot of different methods that can provide you pieces of the puzzle. And then the game will be to take all those pieces together with some computational algorithm to create a, a model of the complex you are interested in that fulfills all the data. So here you see a number of, uh, well, uh, any experiment that might give you access to distance information. So PREs will be NMR, EPR. Uh, allows you to measure distances. Uh, threat experiments will also give you distance information. Those distances might not be very accurate in most instances, but it's information. Uh, you can see here the, the NMI titration. So this is the, the classical NMI experiment used to screen for, uh, for example, small molecule, also used in pharmaceutical settings, but also screen for interactions, especially in cases where the, the binding is not so strong, so weak interactions. Uh, a lot of uh, popularity these days, cross-linking detected by mass spectrometry, for example, also a distance information. Uh, these are information sources coming from NMR, which tell you something about orientations of molecule. Uh, you might do simply uh, work in a wet lab, do metagenesis combined with some binding assay. This is also giving you pieces of the puzzle. And cryo-electron microscopy, small angle X-ray scattering might tell you something about shape of those complexes, although cryo-EM these days goes to reaches resolution that allow you to solve the structure de novo. The, the highest resolution cryo-EM map is 2.6 angstrom currently. And when you don't have anything, you can still go back to bioinformatics and try to predict uh, those interactions. And then uh, the game will be to make use of all this information, encode it in some way, so that you try to uh, take it into account directly in the, in the modeling process. So uh, if you want to read more about uh, uh, integrative modeling in general, here are a number of, of, of reviews that we are listing. So that the first one is really basically the, the classical uh, review when it comes to docking. Uh, there is a, a CAPRI, which is a blind competition for the prediction of protein-protein complexes mainly, is publishing every two, three years a special issue as CASP does for structure prediction of proteins, and in those issues of proteins you can find what is the current state of the art in terms of methodology. So they will be later this year, or January 2016, um, uh, 17, sorry, there will be a new issue of, of CAPRI in proteins. So we just had the evaluation meeting for CAPRI. Uh, well, since the slides will be online later on, so you can look up those references if you need to. 
So now I want to spend some time explaining you actually the, the machinery uh, beyond ad hoc. So how do we do the docking in ad hoc? How do we model complexes in ad hoc? So our main uh, way of, of modeling and incorporating data is to uh, use the data which is very often fuzzy, not very accurate, but we use it in, uh, in, by defining ambi ambiguous and low resolution uh, restraints to guide the docking. And you find again here the entire view of, of data that we can incorporate in our modeling process. So a large majority of this data might be used as uh, ambiguous distance restraints, and I will explain you that later. Uh, one of the features of ad hoc is that we can uh, dock up to six molecules simultaneously, so we are not limited to binary docking, which is the case for quite a few software, but you can uh, dock up to six. We are working currently uh, on lifting this limit of six, but of course the complexity of the modeling increases greatly when you go to a large number of molecules, and this only really makes sense provided you have some good information to drive your modeling. Uh, especially when you go to larger assemblies, if there is symmetry in a system, you can make use of it. You can define a symmetry restraints to guide the modeling process. This, is, uh, this has great value, actually. It limits very much the interaction space that you have to cover, or conformational space, if you want to call it that way. Uh, we also have uh, ways of dealing with flexibility. So ad hoc doors are flexible docking. And I'm going to describe the different stage of, of the modeling process, but uh, uh, we do refine the interfaces. Typically, the complexes that are coming out of, of ad hoc uh, will have uh, qualities, structural qualities that are similar to what you will find in a protein database. So you don't find clashes at the interfaces. Uh, they are refined explicitly in, in water at the end of the protocol. And we have shown a consistent uh, performance in the blind docking competition Capri over the years. So how do we do all this, uh, this search in interaction space? Uh, so we use uh, a combination of empirical force fields, so the classical force fields where you describe bond angles, torsion, rotation around bonds, and then you have the non-bonded interaction term. And in addition to this energy term, we add an additional term which represents the experimental information that we are on the system. And this can be a distance term, this can be a, a diagonal angle, rotations, uh, information about... Uh, so we, we recently implemented cryo-EM restraints into ad hoc, so we can actually dock into the density directly. Uh, the search uh, algorithm is uh, done using a combination of uh, energy minimization and molecular dynamic simulation, so we use... Uh, for that, uh, we need to have the derivative of the energy function. So ad hoc is not a Monte Carlo search. It's really using molecular dynamics for that. And the forces are driving your, your search. So the protocol itself consists of three stages. In the first stage, the molecule is treated as, as rigid bodies, so they are rock solid. In the second stage, we perform a simulated annealing to uh, basically optimize the interface of the complex. And during that stage, Flexibility is introduced both along side chains and the backbone, and the final stage is a refinement in explicit solvent uh, to, to fine tune basically the, the final complexes. And this is quite uh, similar to what is done in uh, NMR structure calculations. So, the first stage uh, this is uh, reasonably fast. There are docking software that are much faster than ad hoc uh, out there, but uh, uh, here we can generate typically in a, in a few seconds uh, a model. So the, the molecules are treated as rigid bodies, so the only degrees of freedom at this stage are rotations and translation, driven initially by the information that you put in. Uh, I already told you we can handle up to six molecules, and typically the sampling in terms of conformation is, the order, is between 10,000 and 100,000 conformation, and we save about 10% uh, are written to disk. Uh, the top scoring conformation, I'm going to explain your scoring scheme uh, later. So about 10-20% of the solution generated at a rigid body stage are then subjected to a semi-flexible uh, refinement stage. So this is uh, done in torsion angle space and not in Cartesian space. This allows us to easily freeze and release uh, torsion angles in a molecule. 
So the, we start at high temperature, cool the system, flexibility is introduced first along the side chains and then along side chains and backbone. And by using torsion angle dynamics, you can easily, uh, again, freeze part of the system without fixing molecule in space. So the molecule can still freely move in space uh, and only the, the interface regions are typically flexible. So if you look at protein-protein interactions, typically the, the amount of flexibility conformational changes that you might get at this stage is not large. It's uh, up to two angstrom typically. But you have to realize that conformational changes are still one of the major challenges in the modeling of complexes, uh, as demonstrated by Capri. They are benchmarked for protein-protein docking, where everything which has a conformational change of more than 2.5 angstrom is classified as a challenging system. Of course, if you dock smaller molecules, so we have worked also on protein peptides, for example, here we can get up to 5 angstrom conformational changes, maybe on the peptide side. Uh, if you introduce data in your modeling, we recently uh, demonstrated the use of CryoEM. Here we can again drive conformational changes to a larger extent. So the amount of conformational changes that you might expect also depends on the, the quality amount of data that you put into the system. So typically all the models that you have refined uh, through the simulated and editing protocol stage are then uh, subjected to a final refinement in explicit solvents. This is a short molecular dynamic simulation in Cartesian space this time, where we define a shell of about 8-9 angstrom of water around the molecule. No periodic monary conditions, so no full-blown molecular dynamics, but uh, uh, this is a gentle protocol, slowly heating the system to 300 Kelvin and cooling it down. And the total time is in the order of a few tenths, maybe 50 picoseconds. So this is nothing like full-blown molecular dynamics. And you will hear about Chromax, for example, in some of our webinar. It's mainly to, to improve the energetic of the complex and, and the rim of the interface. Uh, so at this stage, not much happened in terms of conformational changes. It's rather limited. But the contacts that are made uh, are improving quite uh, uh, a lot during that stage. So, uh, in terms of flexibility, I already mentioned that we can explicitly describe flexibility during the refinement stage uh, by allowing uh, side chain and backbone flexibility on both sides. So, there they are other software that do allow some extent flexibility, also in the small molecule docking fields. But, for example, Autodoc usually uh, mainly consider flexibility in the ligand and the protein is, is rigid. Uh, but what you can also do is to uh, start your docking process not from a single conformation, but from an ensemble of conformations. So you can obtain them from NMR, for example, or you could run molecular dynamic simulations and, and get a, a sampling of possible conformations. You could think of elastic network models to generate those. And uh, you can give an ensemble of structure as starting point to the docking. Uh, usually these ensembles should not be too large, otherwise you get a what we call a dilution problem, because the number of possibilities that explodes. So if we take, for example, 10 molecules on both sides for, for binary complex, you have 100 combination of molecules that you can create. Now, if you're going to sample 10,000 models at a rigid body stage, it means that each combination is only sampled 100 times. So starting a, a docking from 100 conformations uh, is not a good idea. So this is this dilution problem. So it's better to restrict the number of conformation. But if you know that things are happening, for example, loop modeling might be, might be tricky, it might be a good idea to provide such an ensemble. Now about the energetics and scoring. So, so one aspect of docking is to generate models. The other important aspect is to be able to recognize what are the good models out of those. So our force field is uh, OPLS. Uh, we use the OPLS non-bonded parameters. We use, by default, a united atom force field from OPLS. To speed up the calculation, we uh, remove all the hydrogens that have no partial charges. So we keep the ones that carry small partial charges. These are important for hydrogen bonding. But you have the options to keep all hydrogens if required. For example, if you have NOE data from NMR, you should keep them all for the restraints to work. Uh, as you can see, the non-bonded cutoff is rather short uh, compared to full-blown molecular dynamic simulations, 8.5 angstrom. Uh, 
uh, during the vacuum part of the protocol, we have uh, we scaled on electrostatic by using an epsilon of, of 10. During the explicit solvent refinement, epsilon is back at 1 since the water is explicitly present. At the end of, uh, of the protocol, we do cluster the solution. And we have two options of doing that based on an RMSD calculations or based on the contacts that are made at the interface. And we are going to score a solution on a cluster basis. So the ranking is based on a cluster based score. And the score is calculated only on the top four model of each cluster. Since the cluster might have different sizes, we want to calculate the score on the same number of models for each cluster. Uh, usually, when you put information in this kind of modeling, you cannot assume that the largest or the most populated cluster is the best one. In an ideal world, you would see, you would like to see the largest cluster being also the best ranking one, but there is no warranty that this will be the case. And this is also the reason why we don't consider the size of the cluster in our ranking, but only the, the basically the hoc score. And the score is illustrated here. You see that we have uh, different scores at different stages of the docking process. So at the rigid body stage, uh, you see uh, a bit of the experimental information. This is where we put the, the experimental information, but scaled down to only 1%. So if you have a high trust in the data, you might increase that. Bonvar's interactions are also scaled down to only 1% because there might still be clashes. There is no optimization of the interface at this stage. Electrostatic is important, and the dissolvation term. This is an empirical dissolvation term. We take the parameters from uh, Juan Fernandez Recchio, and we select for complexes that have a rather large surface area. This is this uh, negative term here. At the final stage, this is where we will be ranking the clusters. The clustering is only done uh, pretty much at the water stage. So we still have the experimental information, 10%, full van der Waals, 20% of the electrostatic, but with epsilon equal to 1 in this case, and the dissolvation term. This very simple scheme, which looks like it has never been optimized because it has nice round number, uh, has proven very uh, robust, actually, in the in latest round of Capri. There was a joint Gas-Capri uh, scoring competition, among other, where, uh, because of the time pressure in this round, we didn't uh, do anything fancy, we simply blindly score using this very simple function. And uh, we, we were the best scoring group uh, in this round of CAS Capri. There is a paper about this round of CAS Capri that just came out in a journal of molecular biology by Mark Lansing and Shoshana Vodak, if you want to read more about it. So this is our scoring scheme. So now I want to give you just one application exam to give you a little flavor of uh, what you can do. And I'm, I chose, uh, in the spirit of integrative modeling, uh, a system where, in which we have been using actually a bit of metagenesis data, but also different kind of mass spectrometry data to model uh, the system. And it has to do with uh, the cyanobacterial circadian timing. This is basically the internal clock of those bacteria, uh, which consists of a very simple system of three proteins. Uh, so I don't want to go into the biology and function, but the information that we had for the modeling from, from, NA, from uh, native mass spectrometry, we knew the stoichiometry of the complex, 6 to 1 stoichiometry. From HD exchange, we could map the binding interface. And then there was one more piece of information that was uh, delivered by uh, uh, the, the collision cross-section, basically, of those complexes, which you can also extract from, from MS data. So this story has been uh, published. Uh, so you can read all the detail about it. So this is just a mapping on the structure of KIB of uh, the regions that are protected upon complex formation. These are the blue regions. So this is an interface information that we give into ad hoc as a list of amino acids. Basically, ad hoc will try to enforce that those amino acids should be part of an interface. It will not define what the orientation should be, but it will make sure that those amino acids should be at the interface. If you look on the KIC, the system here is a bit more complex. So it's, a, it's an examer which consists of two rings. And you see protection data that you are seeing actually while well, six binding site. Uh, it's a six to one binding. Uh, you see a site on the top of the structure, and there is another site at the bottom. So there is a communication allosteria in this complex. Uh, so for our docking process, we targeted both the upper region and the lower region, so we generated two sets of solutions. 
And then I mentioned this collision cross-section from MS, which allows you to filter basically the solution. So we didn't use that information for the modeling, but we back calculated those collision cross-sections from the model. And you see here the, the two set of docking and the cluster that correspond to those. And these are the collision cross-sections that are calculated, back calculated for the different models. And they are shown in this plot here, where the dotted line indicates uh, the experimental range uh, for, for the collision cross-section. So the cluster in this case are ranked uh, based on the ad hoc score, and you see that cluster one nicely fit in, in, in the middle of the range. Uh, cluster three seems to be also, uh, and four are uh, within the range, the experimental range, and these are all clusters that correspond to the docking or the binding to the top part of the model. All the systems that bind to the bottom part of the, of the complex will result in a much larger collision cross section, which is not consistent with the data. So, our prediction in this case was that our best scoring model of Haddock, which fits uh, the collision cross section data. And in this case, it's also the most populated solution, but there's no warranty that it's the right one. We can also deal with more complex molecules. This is just one example where we worked based on NMR data at modeling the interaction uh, of uh, lipid 2 with uh, fungal defensin. And this is uh, just to show you the complexity of, of this kind of molecule. So you have sugar, pyrophosphate, you have amino acid, and then you have this bactoprenol tail. This kind of complex molecule uh, cannot really be run through the server. This is too complex, so you need to build topologies but if you are able to do that, then you can use the NMR information. And here you see that in magenta, the binding site mapped by NMR, those yellow surfaces are the binding sites to the membrane. Actually, this protein binds to the membrane and extracts lipid 2 from the cell wall. So now a few words about the web server. So the, the, we have released uh, this year version 2.2 of a web server. Uh, it's quite heavily used, more than 7,000 registered users worldwide, uh, more than 120,000 runs have been run since its opening, and currently about one-third of, uh, well, in total, one-third of the run have been running on a European and worldwide grid infrastructure. What you can also see here is that there they are different levels of access to the server. So at the basic level, you just submit a list of amino acids and your PDB models, and that's all you need to do the docking. At the GUU level that you see here, in principle, you can fine tune, if you know what you are doing, up to 500 parameters. You can define symmetry during between the molecule. You can add additional restraints, like from RDCs, from NMR. So there's a, and there is a, a gradation of, of complexity during these uh, various uh, servers. So this is uh, a map of our user base. So, so it's well represented worldwide, uh, with the majority of users actually in India and in the US, next to Europe. And what is also interesting to look at this uh, here is the uh, the usage that uh, our users are making of, of the server. So we developed Haddock mainly for protein, protein, and then we have been working on protein nucleic acids and peptides. But you see, for example, that there is quite a fraction of users that are using it also for protein small molecule. So you can do small molecule docking with ad hoc uh, using the web server. Uh, this is just to, to show you where a great job coming from the server might land. A uh, lot of sites in Europe, but also uh, in Beijing, in Malaysia, Taiwan, and, and even in the US. So the jobs are being distributed around the world depending on where there are resources and, and through the EGI. Grid, we have access to more than 110,000 CPU cores to run those. So what's happening behind the scene when you submit a job to the server? So you can submit different types of experimental data in a, in a given format. You submit PDB files. There will be a validation step done by the server on those input data. And then we start running the Haddock process. We generate uh, the topology for the different proteins, the different molecules. Uh, we define basically the chemistry, define the, the, the force field. At this stage, also, all missing atoms will be built automatically. So you don't have to worry that you are missing a side chain in your protein. This will be uh, done by the server. And once this is done, this runs locally here in Utrecht, we start the docking process where you have rigid body, flexible refinement, water refinement. And this will be sent to this worldwide grid or run locally. And then there is a post-processing uh, analysis uh, 
which is done like clustering and, and scoring and, and the results are going to present, be presented to you. So what does the server do for you that uh, manual installation of Haddock will not do, at least not at this time, maybe in the future? Uh, it validates your input PDB files, it checks for duplication of residues, so you have to remove those if you have duplication of side chains, for example, in high resolution crystal structure. Um, multiple occupancies might also be a problem that you encounter in high resolution structures. Uh, we run more poverty on, on the input files to uh, correct some issues, for example, with sidechain as part in sidechain and define protonation states. Uh, it might define automatically the, the restraints depending on the, what you input. And if your molecule has gaps, meaning that uh, like if you were to dock an antibody which consists of two chain, uh, we define a number of restraints to keep the fragment together during the high uh, temperature simulated annealing stage. If you don't do that, the molecule might drift slightly apart because of the high temperature and kinetic energy in the system. The input restraints are validated, uh, so it's using uh, explore CNS format. For small ligand cofactors, we will get topologies and parameters from those and we use for that uh, prodrug as an as a input. And it does all the post analysis uh, of your docking results, so cluster analysis and statistics. And this is a snapshot of what the, the server might return to you. So for each cluster you get statistics, excuse me, each cluster you will get statistics of the different uh, component of the Hadoc score, Hadoc score, and you have also some visual uh, analysis of the results. So we hope in the future, through BioExcel, to build a much more interactive analysis tool for, for the server. But this uh, requires some work. So running locally, I think I should probably uh, speed up a little bit to leave some time for questions, but uh, let's go quickly. So if you have a local installation of, of Haddock, you will have to prepare your PDB. So you will have to worry about double occupancies, you need to renumber to avoid overlap. So often question that we get is I want to dock a homodimers, but there's overlap in numbering. Yes, then you have to, to renumber those. And we have a number of uh, useful tools actually to, to help you do this. So you can visit our GitHub repository. Um, the server accept ensembles of, uh, of input structures. If you run manually, you will have to split them in single files. You have to manually define a protonation state of histidine. The server does that automatically for you if you want to let it do for that. Uh, you will have also to prepare your restraints files. You can use the one of the interface of the server to do that. Uh, you need to generate some initial files that contain the information. Uh, and more importantly, if you work with small molecules, you have to worry about generating the ligand topologies and parameters. So you can use again ProDrug, which is available on the server, or SC pipe, or even the ATP, this automatic topology builder from Alan Mark in Australia. And you would have to edit the parameter files. Some of this can be done online using uh, uh, online forms that we have on our web page. So in summary, a local run will be uh, some manual editing of those files or online. You will have to give the Haddock commands in your window to start uh, the run. This will create a complete directory structure and then in that directory you will have to edit uh, and change the parameters that you need to change. You will have to copy the parameter files for the small molecule if you have them to the proper uh, location. And at the end of the run you will have to do all the analysis manually that the server is doing for you. Again, hopefully in, in some future version, uh, we are working on ad hoc 3.0, some of this will be, some of what the server is doing now will be integrated directly in the local version. So that should make uh, things for your life also easy as a local user of ad hoc. So some additional information to wrap up. So if you are interested in getting the software, you should look at our website. Under the software directory, you will find here the, the link to ad hoc, where there is information about the licensing scheme. Uh, it's free for non-profit organization and commercial people should contact us. Uh, so you find in the Haddock sites, the, so what I mean, the, the online form where you can edit some of your input files even if you are running local version. You will find an online manual describing a lot of the parameters, what they are doing, describing also how to manually analyze the results. The link to the servers are there. Uh, and importantly, there is also this link to Ask BioExcel. Uh, we have also 
ad hoc related software, which is freely available from, uh, from the ad hoc GitHub repository. So this is useful to manipulate input PDB files, uh, clustering based on contact if you're interested. These other tools are related to some other more. This is more cryoEM related. On our website, you also find some tutorial. So here we posted uh, last week after the CAPRI meeting uh, an Abinicio docking port uh, tutorial using uh, symmetrical, uh, comp for symmetrical complexes, taking one of the CAS CAPRI target for that. Uh, there is still the WeNMR website where we have been contributing, where you can find uh, also documentation and uh, some, some useful information for different uh, aspects of, of using ad hoc. And our medium of choice now for questions related to ad hoc is uh, askbioexcel.eu, which has recently been released, where you can post questions uh, and generate topics that are specific to a specific question that you have. Uh, so these are a list of papers that are relevant for, for ad hoc in general. A lot of people have contributed over the year for, for developing and still continuing to develop in uh, ad hoc, so we hope also within BioExcel to come with a lot of nice, new, interesting tools to make your life easier. And with that, I'm finished for this part. Uh, again, here are the links to ask BioExcel. If you are using ad hoc and you have questions, this is the way to contact us. Bombalab.org slash software is the way to, to look at our tools, to request the software. And ad hoc science UU is, is giving you access to the web portal and some other portals. So now it's time for the question and answer session. And for that session, I'm giving back the word to Rosen. Thank you, Alexander. I hope uh, all the attendees enjoyed the webinar and found it useful. We have uh, one question asked by Jesse. I'm going to give him the mic and let's see if uh, we can hear him. Hi, Jesse. Could you? Say something. Oh, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So ah, great. Yes. So fantastic talk. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, I have a question about the running Hadoop locally. So how how well does the software scale in a distributed cluster environment, and uh, how does it scale in uh, uh, on a large kind of a multi CPU shared memory server? Okay, so the, the computations that we are doing, except for the pre-processing and post-processing that are more kind of sequential steps, all the docking process is uh, embarrassingly parallel. So we distribute a large number of jobs typically. So if you have a cluster with say 200 cores, so our internal clusters typically the, we submit in the order of 100 or 200 jobs in parallel to the system. So that's a perfect uh, use case. Uh, so we, it's, it's not worth parallelizing the single structure calculation. It's better to distribute, to run in parallel a large number of, of docking runs. And this is exactly what we are doing. It's also the reason why it's working well on this grid infrastructure, because each job is independent and uh, they are not very uh, computationally expensive. So if we run, say, and, and if you have uh, one node, uh, so these days you might have a 64 core node, so you could run, say, 50 structure calculation in parallel at the same time. This is going to, to work perfectly fine. So I think if you are an average docking run of an average size complex, if you have 100 core at, uh, at hand, might take maybe half an hour. And from yep, that great. half an hour, probably 50% uh, of it will be uh, post-processing. Like the clustering takes time. There are, there are some anal post-processing analysis that do take time. Yes, and the clustering is, does that use multiple cores as well? No, so the clustering doesn't use multiple cores. So there we could probably win time because now the server, if you do RMSD clustering, so you have to read in all the models, you have to calculate the pairwise RMSD between all models. Mm -hmm. And that's a bit the, the slow part. The fraction of contact clustering is much faster because we don't need to fit. We just calculate uh, contact between the molecules and this is done very quickly. So the fraction of contact clustering uh, is going to run probably in, uh, say, five minutes. So this also scales much better. Yeah, thank you. Welcome. 
we don't have more questions in the queue. If uh, any of the attendees has a question, you can uh, post it in the questions interface or in the chat. Well, um, it looks like we don't have other questions yet. I uh, oh, there's one. Just yes, there came one. Just a second. Nanjie Deng. Hello, Nanjie. Can you hear us? Well, I guess the question is uh, yes. Uh, how do I restrain a torsion angle during docking? Yes. So. In, um, so Haddock is using CNS for the structure calculation, and CNS is a software which is used for X-ray refinement, but also NMR structure calculations. So you can define diagonal angle restraints uh, with a given error margin for the, the diagonal angle that you want to, to restrain. So this requires basically four uh, selection of four atoms, and uh, you can output that in the server. So let me. Uh, you're still seeing my screen, I guess. Oh, let's me. I'm showing my screen, so I'm going to switch now. So you should be seeing now the, the web browser, and I'm going to go to the Bovin Lab. We're going to go to the Haddock software, the Haddock manual. Let me blow this up, and you see. Uh, to uh, have PB4, ambiguous restraints, pseudo contact shift restraints. So I don't have an example here for the, which is unfortunate for the diagonal angle restraints. But the diagonal angle restraints. So they are basically a selection of four atoms. So there is a, a the reference paper that you want to check where we give an example of each uh, type of restraints is actually uh, the or Nature Protocol 2010 paper. What you have to realize if you define diagonal angle is that they are not going to define your intermolecular interactions. They can only work within one molecule. But uh, there is an upload uh, in, in the server. Again, if you go to the, uh, for example, the expert interface, you see a menu which now tells, allows you to upload a diagonal angle restraint file. So you can give that to the server and it will be taken into account. Of course, the part of the molecule that you restrain should be flexible, because if they are rigid, nothing will happen. So this can be used, for example, for, for small peptides. If you are docking a small peptide and you know that it should have an alpha helical conformation, that will be the way to, to impose that. So I see another question in the... Uh, hello? Yes? Hey, um, so I'm, I'm doing a um, protein and RNA docking. Um, and my RNA is, is double-stranded, and it's um, a little bit symmetrical. So the way I've been um, doing this is I would specify the amino acids that I have from um, NMR data on the mm -hmm. protein. But on the RNA side, we don't have any base pair um, data. Um, so the way I've been getting around this is picking one side of the RNA and just specifying those base pairs. But um, I'm finding it's kind of a little bit biased because there's still the rotation of the RNA. And um, I, I'm looking at also making the RNA slightly flexible. So I guess my question is... is um, is it possible to um, only give data for one of the, like for the protein itself? Um, yes. RNA. Because every, every time I've submitted it, it always comes back with um, an error. So, so, so the way to do it. So we've been working on RNA, but we have not really published any systematic uh, benchmarking there. Uh, mm. And we have actually uh, been running exactly the scenario that you are, you are telling us. So the way to do that will be, uh, so first of all, for RNA, you need a, a good starting structure. Uh, 
uh, if you don't have a, so if, if you know your starting structure for the INA, then, then it's fine, but uh, otherwise you might be into trouble. But the way to do it, in, <coughs> excuse me, in this case will be to define on the protein side your active residues, and mm -hmm. for the RNA side, you define the entire RNA as passive. So in the interface of ad hoc, you will give the list of bases in your RNA all as passive, so that you don't bias any region. Another small piece of information which, which we just recently found out, if you're going to do RNA docking, you should turn off the dissolvation energy term from the scoring function. So these are unpublished results, but uh, it gives a much better sampling, especially at the rigid body stage. So define your entire RNA as passive, turn off dissolution. Okay, so so um, that kind of brings up the other point, um, which is the starting structure of the RNA, um, I got basically from, um, you know, a PDB, but the sequence of the RNA is different, but it's how I think that the RNA would be shaped. So I made I made that piece of RNA, even though the sequence is different, as kind of a rigid RNA, and then and then dock this piece. Um, but I have I have generated through other you know, um, and and my RNA is double stranded. Um, so so there is so so the main structural difference in this RNA is is just basically bending of the of the helix. Um, so would this semi flexible if I if I generated my piece of RNA with my my actual sequence of the that we're using in our experiments, um, and I would would it be better to use a semi flexible or the flexible for this or you know making them middle um, parts? Yeah. Like, um, so the yes, yeah, so the for RNA there, so for DNA in principle, the server will analyze the structure and define automatically. Uh, base pairing restraints and also some restraint puts impose some restraints on the diadol, the phosphate uh, bone. Uh, for RNA, I'm not sure that this is going to work properly. So, my advice will be to start to just uh, use the automatic flexibility definition that you only put flexibility in the regions that are in contact with the protein so that you don't pre decide where to do. And I think that's important because if you define the entire RNA as passive, the binding could be at any region on the, on the RNA surface. So you only want, only want to do that region uh, flexible. So let the server automatically do the flexibility. It means that each model that you generate might have a slightly different region that becomes flexible. It depends on the contact that are made. Um, what I will also suggest is to maybe you could define a few distance restraints if you know the base pairing, for example, to ensure that nothing bad's happened to your RNA during the, the modeling process. It depends also a bit on the size. And so if you have a, like a tRNA which has a lot of 3D structure, it's going to be more stable. If you just have a short double helix, uh, it might uh, distort more. So you could add basically intramolecular restraints uh, and give them as an ambiguous to enforce base pairing in your RNA to keep to maintain the structure while uh, it is refined yeah, with flexibility. Okay. Clear? Yeah. Uh, sorry. Sorry. One. Um, so what I also have SAC scattering data. Do you you get you were mentioning that you could fit um, some of these models to to a lot of your um, data here. Um, so do you guys have anything for tax as far as like, you know, if I gave you guys a curve or a shape, um, would you guys be able to model to that or, or what's the appropriate way to enter in SACS? Data? So for SACS, we only are we only able to score with SACS. So there is no, well, there are restraining functions that have been uh, developed for SACS uh, and that are actually even available in CNS, but they are very expensive in terms of uh, computation. So for, oh, okay. for taking them in a calculation, it will be too expensive. But what you can do is to score your model with SACS. And actually, we have, we have a, published a paper uh, about uh, SACS. It's in Acta Crystallographica. So if you look up on the website, you will find it. And if you look here on the WeRMR sites now, you, sh you still see my screen, I assume. Yes. So we have a topic here about how to use SACS data in scoring decoys. Okay. So, so here you could you could run, but I guess if you want to do so, you can do the scoring at the end. Just di discriminate your cluster using the SACS data, 
You can even do that online using a, a Chrysol. So there is a web server where you can do online. You don't even need local software. Or you could do a local run and then already do a scoring round at the rigid body stage. So you manually score at the rigid body before going in flexible stage. So that you enrich your solutions with models that fit your SACs before you put uh, flexibility into it. Okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your um, this, this webinar. is very good. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, so these were all the questions that we had. I want to tell everybody that uh, a recording of the webinar and the slides will be available on the website. Uh, and just to mention again that uh, BioX, this is the first webinar of a series of webinars that uh, BioXL is, will continue to organize on uh, different topics, covering mainly the interest of the interest groups that I mentioned earlier. Uh, and uh, our next webinar will be on performance tuning and optimization of Gromax with uh, Mark Abraham, who is the core developer and uh, project manager of Gromax. Uh, it will be on the 11th of May. Uh, we have two more additional webinars uh, already scheduled that you can find about from our website. Um, I would like to ask everyone that uh, in a follow-up, email uh, I will send you a link to a to a very short survey which uh, with just a few very short questions that we would like to hear from you how about your experience with the webinar we would really like to make them very useful uh, to you make them better and specifically uh, let us know about any questions or topics that you would like to get covered in future webinars so that they're more level relevant to the community. Uh, so, uh, yes, and with that, uh, I would like to thank Alexander Bove for the very nice and useful presentation. And I hope to see everyone again in our next event. Thank you all and have a good day. Thank you, Alexander. Thanks, Rosen, and thank you everyone for, for listening. Yeah. Bye.